Dear friends, how powerful can the fate of a prostitute be? And has the new Israelite community that saw the horrible 40 years of obliteration in the wilderness learned to trust God now? As Israel stood before the flooded river Jordan, join us to witness another miracle identical to the parting of the Red Sea. Will the skeptic still say this is another natural coincidence? Or is this a miracle of God? Welcome back, dear brothers and sisters. We thank God for your lives, even as you join us again for today's Bible study. We rejoice in knowing that we have a great and marvelous God who takes care of His children and never fails them. The first and foremost thing is God reaching out to Joshua, the new leader. To assure him of the great task ahead, God spoke to him saying the words, be strong three times consecutively and assuring him that he will never leave him nor forsake him. But Joshua's strength and courage was to come from seeking God with obedience through keeping his law. Right after this, we saw Joshua command his leaders to prepare the people within three days to enter into Canaan. He also reminded the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, their promises to Moses that they will fight alongside their brothers, even if they choose to stay on the other side of Jordan. As preparations for the onslaught on the Canaanites starts, I welcome you to another session of Through the Bible. Joshua chapter 2 Here we are introduced to a woman a very shady character. This immoral woman was Rahab. The remarkable fact, however, is that in the New Testament, she is listed with those who are commonly called the heroes of the faith. Chapter 11 of Hebrews Verse 31, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. Now, let's not think of Hebrews 11 as only a record of heroes of faith, because that puts the emphasis on humanity. Put the emphasis upon faith. The men and women recorded there illustrate what faith did in all ages under all circumstances in their lives. For us, it means that faith can do the same thing for us, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 Another startling fact is that Rahab is in the genealogy of Christ. The New Testament opens with that genealogy and you don't read five verses of the New Testament until you come to this woman's name. How did she get into the genealogy of Christ? She got there by faith. As you can see, the chapter before us introduces us to this remarkable woman. Verse 1 of chapter 2 Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent to said, especially Jericho. So they went and end stayed there. You may be thinking that this is another mistake. Earlier they had sent the spies to see if they could take. They are being sent not to see if they can take the land, but to find the best way to enter the land. The purpose is entirely different, you see. Well, here are a few more observations. Comparing the spies sent by Moses and the two spies sent by Joshua. Remember, Moses had sent 12 spies. Their report brought fear and unbelief. But the two spies Joshua had sent brought confidence. Moses acted on the people's suggestion and they chose 12 spies to spy out the land. It was a step that was taken publicly. And Moses was obligated to report the findings of the 12 spies. Ten of them incited all to fear the giants whereas Joshua and Caleb were the only two faithful spies who had said Canaan could be conquered. Now here we find Joshua doing the smart thing of keeping it secret. He wasn't obligated to make known the findings of the two spies. 
However, he acted on their information. Now verse 2 of Joshua chapter 2. Rehab, a citizen of Jericho, opens her home to the spies. Verse 2. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. Verse 4. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. Verse 6. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. Verse 7. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. She told her king an outright lie to protect these men. And in doing so, she actually jeopardized her own life. Now, why would she put her life on a line like this? She didn't have to. She is in a business, by the way, where anything goes. Why did she lie to her own people and protect the enemy? Before we see the answer to that question, let me raise another question. Is it possible to condone Rahab's action? Scripture is very clear on the fact that we as children of God are to obey authority and those that have the rule over us. Rahab certainly did not do that. That would be one explanation. However, there is another explanation that I consider meaningful to us today. A believer should certainly obey the authorities and those who have rule over us. One who follows Christ should be the most law-abiding citizen in the land. But when the laws of a state conflict with God's revealed will, then the child of God have no choice but to obey the command of God. This was the experience of Peter and John when the authorities attempted to silence them in their witness for Christ. Acts 4 verse 19 to 20 whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God. Judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. The believer is to obey the word of God rather than the word of man. That should be our attitude as children of God. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. She gives an insight into the thinking of the Canaanites at that time. The word is out that a great company of people is coming into that land. They believe that they are going to take the land. The population is stirred up and they are afraid. This is the report that Rahab gives the spies. I guess she was in a position to get all the gossip and she could see that all of her people were terrified because of Israel's advance. Verse 10 We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan whom you completely destroyed. Notice we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. How long ago was this? That happened 40 years before they arrived at the Jordan River. During those 40 years, God had been giving the people of Canaan an opportunity to turn to Him. How do we know that? Because God had said to Abraham, Abraham that his seed would be strangers in a foreign land for 400 years. Then in the fourth generation they would come again because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Genesis chapter 15 verse 16. That was 420 years before this. In other words, God was going to give the people of Canaan 420 years 
to decide whether or not they would turn to him. The critic declares that the God of the Old Testament was a great big bully, that he was cruel and barbaric. When God gave the people of Canaan 420 years to repent, isn't that long enough? But God extended the time by 40 more years and saw to it that they heard how he had revealed himself by delivering his people from Egypt. God did not destroy a people that had not heard about him. He gave them ample opportunity to turn to him. The question is, how much longer do you think God should have given them? In the New Testament, God has not changed. He has made it very clear that those who reject Jesus Christ are going to hell. Does it shock you to hear that in this very civilized society that discounts the existence of hell? When God's judgment falls, I am sure there will be some soft-hearted and soft-headed folk on the sideline who will say, He should have given them more time. More time? My friend, over all the years that have gone by, God is patient. He is slow to anger. He is merciful. How much longer do you and I have to wait? He has been giving the world ample opportunity to turn to Christ. The harlot said, we have heard and notice the reaction. Verse 11, when we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Not only did they hear this, but also they knew it was true. Faith comes by hearing. Action is taken in faith. There are a great many people today who know as a historical fact that Jesus Christ died, was buried and rose again. But they are not saved. What saves you? Trust. Make him your personal savior. It is to have a personal relationship with him. Now that's not all Rahab said. Verse 12. Now then please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. Verse 14. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. She not only believed, but she is acting on that belief. This is her reason for putting her life in jeopardy to protect enemy spies. She heard, she believed, then she acted upon her belief. She asks for kindness. She's acting on her faith. She takes a step of faith in view of what was to come. Faith is taking steps in view of what is going to happen, even though there is no evidence of it. Faith is an active step taken towards the direction where God is leading, even though the destination may not be all that quite clear. This is salvation, friend. When you hear the gospel, the good news of what Christ has done for you. You must not only believe it as a historical fact, but you must trust Christ yourself. So this woman trusted the fact that God was going to give them that land. She turned to the living and true God. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. The spies promise to spare all of her family that is with her in the house when Jericho is attacked. Verse 18 Unless when we enter the land you have tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house. And if the king of the city of Jericho had turned to God, he would have been saved. In fact, the whole city could have been spared if they had believed in God. Now we will look at the final verses of this chapter, the report of the spies. Verse 23. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river and came to Joshua son of Nun and told him everything that had been happened to them. 
They said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. You see, the spies' report is entirely different from the spies who went into the land 40 years earlier. It is not a question now whether or not they will go into the land. They are going in. All inhabitants of the country do faint because of us, is the information they get from Rehab. Now, I would like to make a statement so that each one of us could hold this as a principle when we are walking in this complex life. Any action or step taken prompted by our faith in God or the fear of God is definitely acceptable by God. However, this does not necessarily mean that this action or step taken will be automatically accepted by people around. In fact, there may be severe pressure and conflict. Now let's study chapter 3. It's about the crossing of the river Jordan. Crossing the Jordan River into the land of Canaan was a major turning point as far as the faith of the Israelites was concerned. Almost 40 years earlier, the children of Israel had faced a similar crisis, but they had failed. To slip away into the wilderness of Sinai by crossing the Red Sea required some faith. However, to invade the land of Canaan by crossing the Jordan River took a great deal more faith because, having once crossed the river, there would be no possibility of escape. Once in the land, they would have to face the enemy head on with their armies, chariots and walled cities. The entire nation took this step together in complete commitment to God. Verse 1 Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards. God commanded Joshua and the children of Israel to cross over the Jordan River. When they went over the Jordan River, it was quite different from their crossing the Red Sea. When they crossed the Red Sea, Moses went down to the water and smote it with his rod. All that night, the waters rolled back. But when they crossed the Jordan River, it was actually a greater miracle. For it was at flood stage, and their crossing caused a holding back of the waters that were rushing to the Dead Sea. Also, something new has been added. The ark is to go down far ahead of the people, 3,000 feet, which is almost a mile. And it is to be carried by priests who are to come to the edge of the Jordan River and stand there. Verse 15 Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carry the ark reach the Jordan and their feet touch the water's edge, when the priests came to the edge of the Jordan River, the flow of water was restrained, as if a dam had been put over it. The waters that were this side of it passed down, and before long there was a dry passage. This is one of the greatest miracles recorded in Scripture. This was the spring of the year. That land had two rainy seasons, in the fall and in the spring. The spring rains were most abundant. The Jordan was at flood stage. It is entirely possible that the people on the west side of Jordan felt that they had several days or maybe several weeks before the Israelites could get across the river. They probably felt that there was no immediate danger. Some of them, however, may have had a lurking fear knowing that 40 years earlier these people had crossed the Red Sea. Remember, Rahab knew about this. Verse 16 The water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. 
while the water flowing down to the sea of the Araba, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Note that the priests moved to the center of the Jordan River and stood there, holding the ark until all of the children of Israel had passed over. The Israelites crossed the river at Jericho, but the waters were dammed up way back to the city of Adam. What was taking place at the Jordan River represented the death and resurrection of Christ and his work on the cross. Now the ark is one of the finest types of the Lord Jesus Christ given in the Old Testament. Although there are several that are conspicuous and outstanding, the ark had been in the very heart of Israel's camp for 40 years during the wilderness march. Every night when they came into camp, the entire 12 tribes of Israel camped about the ark. It was the very center, but now for the first time, that which speaks of Christ goes ahead to the Jordan River and enters it first. Christ goes before us in death. Of course, he goes with us in life as we pass through this world. He is with us. But he went before us in death and when our Lord entered death, he entered it for you and for me. The ark was the type of Christ. It represented God. Though there was respect in handling the ark, it was not supposed to be used as a magical box. The ark was taken in front at God's command. However, during the time of Eli the priest, if you remember, the people use it as a magical tool. They did not experience victory. In fact, the ark was taken into Philistia. God cannot be put in a box, as it were, and be used to fulfill our own plans. The plan was God's and he communicated it to Joshua who in turn told all the people. He instructed them to place the ark at the center of Jordan as all the people crossed. Many a time we make our plans and then expect God to bless it simply because we open in a word of prayer. We go to God with our plans and ask him to sign his approval. Well, isn't it far better to go to God trusting His judgment and plan of action? We should go to Him with our name signed underneath beforehand on a blank sheet. He needs to fill that sheet with His directions, which we should be prepared to readily follow. That is trust and faith. We see both Joshua and Rahab acting by faith. They trusted and moved in the direction God gave after having heard and seen all his mighty acts. Both took steps knowing that God was about to fulfill the impossible. Though the destination wasn't visible, they knew God could and would do the impossible and they made the necessary arrangements to experience it. Dear friend, you know a lot about God, his power and his mighty acts. But are you taking the necessary steps to experience the impossible? Rahab, having heard, asked for kindness and helped in protecting the spies. Joshua, knowing his God and after having experienced his powerful hand through those 40 years, did not doubt that God would help him cross the river Jordan. Well, what is the impossible obstruction that is facing before you? Well, if you are up on the wall with a possible threat of destruction or if a watery grave lies before you, remember God can do the impossible through you. However, you need to place yourself in a position where your trust is completely in Him and in Him alone. Trust His word. Take steps in the direction He is leading you. Though you can't quite clearly see the end, God cares for you and He wants the best for you. Trust Him and move on by faith. Without faith, remember, it is impossible to please God. So therefore, trust and move on in faith. 
Dear friends, there are many who outrightly reject the Red Sea miracle, or at the most acknowledge it as a coincidence of natural forces. Today's lesson, therefore, should be a reminder to any doubters that a being addressed as divine has the omnipotent power specifically to address situations in favor of his people. And Yahweh is his name. This was just an addition to the series of plagues in Egypt and the heavenly wonders displayed through the wilderness journey. In fact, the prophets write down through Jesus and his apostles displayed natural, unexplainable signs and wonders to the glory of God. Now to us who believe, Jesus promised that our mountains can be done away with and our burdens removed with true faith. The Lord of the universe is our God and He has conquered the prince of this world on the cross. Whatever situation you are in, let the word of God encourage you and you. He can part your Jordans and lead you into Canaan. He has a plan for you and I pray that you will let Him captain your battles. May God continue to favor you. Amen. Did you like this program? Give us a missed call now and you may be the next winner.